Okay, so we're now recording for the Mars Society of Philadelphia, March 11th uh, meeting. Um, so our special guest tonight is Doug Plata of the Space Development Network, and he is going to talk about the Instabase. And at the end, I'll give some more notes about a Kickstarter that we're looking to do for a space garden in conjunction with the Instabase. All right, thank you, Steli. Um, yeah, so I'm the uh, president and founder of the Space Development Network, as you can probably tell. I'm also an urgent care physician in Southern California, Redlands, and I've been uh, uh, working with, with uh, Steli and Colin and, and many others in the agriculture working group of, of the Space Development Network. Uh, and through that contact, here I am to go ahead and present about uh, a project that myself and some other members of the Space Development Network are, are working on. Uh, and I think it's very exciting and has a lot of potential. So it's called the Instabase concept uh, of the Space Development Network. And just very fundamentally, an Instabase is exactly what it says. It's a complete base for an initial crew of eight uh, and every module is inflatable. And so it can be all packaged up into a one large uh, less than 100 ton package. So we're talking Starship package <clears throat> that's landed uh, and the straps are cut uh, and they uh, and you just open a valve condensed gas and there it is, you know, within an afternoon, you've got a, you've got a base. 3D printing, you know, it takes a lot of energy, a lot of time. There's a lot of, you know, risk in terms of uh, is, is it strong enough to, to withstand the air pressure inside. So I think the, uh, uh, inflatables have distinct uh, advantages. And so could we, on a space advocate level, could we illustrate uh, what an Instabase might look like? And the fact of the matter is, I'm actually constructing this thing right now uh, in the um, gymnasium, my high school, old high school gymnasium. We're making out of sheet plastic and tape. So we're making the just the plastic version of it. But of course, the final version, the one that would actually go to the moon would be made out of Kevlar and have fully functioning life support systems. And of course, we're not gonna do that. So we're mostly doing this on, a, on an illustration level. But you can see the different modules. Uh, and um, so I'm, I'm sort of, I think that we're gonna see a base established on the moon first. Uh, but then within two to four years after that, I think that the same thing is gonna happen on Mars, especially if, if Elon Musk has his way. Elon at, has actually said that uh, he expects that there will be a lunar base before going to Mars, which is a little hard to, to believe him saying that, but in popular science, he, he is quoted as saying that. I think it's just gonna be a very short period of time and there's gonna be sort of parallel development on the moon and Mars. So this is not the Instabase, but I think this is a pretty good illustration of what uh, a completely inflatable uh, uh, set of habitats uh, could be on Mars. Instant construction. Um, and, and after we establish the self using inflatables, we can go on to 3D printing and, and, and whatnot, but it's just such a quick way to, to establish a foothold off Earth. So here's the, the different HABs. Uh, upper left, we have the bed HAB, which is uh, habitats for four couples. These are long-term residents, very historic people. Uh, two bath habs, a living hab with two floors. The bottom floor is kitchen, top floor is living room. Uh, on the bottom there, we have the arts hab, which is things like music, uh, fine arts, uh, as well as dance, which is gonna be very interested in, in reduced gravity, where, whether on the moon or Mars. Uh, and then the work hab with these different wings, the large wing is for machining, uh, and the other wings are for chemistry and for robotics and, and for geology. Uh, the, at the top, there's the observatory or the tower. Uh, and this is uh, pretty much aesthetic. Uh, and it's just a, a tall thing that they can, they can climb up into and be able to look at long distances from the top of their base. The two green halves uh, are the volume or size to support the nutritional needs of initial crew of eight people. Uh, and then we have the spin hab, uh, which is an important concept, and that is an indoor centrifuge. Uh, and uh, if you do not turn your head, you do not have Coriol Coriolis effects. And so this is a way to be able to extend crew stay and, and make the base more permanent is, is by getting a full G uh, several hours a day standing uh, in the centrifuge, okay? Now, and then there's these accessory things. There's these spheres, 
And of course, this is just a notional concept. I'm hoping that the space architects can really take this concept and make it uh, much nicer. But there's different tanks for water and organics and, and for oxygen, et cetera. And there's different uh, dimensions, which I've used to go ahead and create the, uh, the plastic version of the Instabase. Here is a, uh, here's a, an artist rendering of the Instabase. I uh, just now got the, the lunar one. I would like for her to go ahead and place it on Mars because I think the same thing could be applied in, in either location. Uh, an obvious question is shielding. Um, for the sake of aesthetics, uh, instead of covering it with regolith uh, on the moon or Mars, uh, it is, um, uh, it is uh, we're, we're saying that water sourced in the permanently shadowed craters of the moon and water on Mars uh, would be pumped between layers uh, of, of the, uh, the habitats and provide uh, at least uh, the minimum uh, radiation shielding, which is for sol solar particle events. Uh, you can see in the background, a starship uh, is landing and what I call the New Eagle or a Blue Origin uh, based uh, reusable lander of 25 to 50 people at a time. So <clears throat> let's go through uh, the different components. Uh, so the living hab uh, would be a, a place and, and this is this is not my rendering. This is just somebody else, so it doesn't fit exactly. Uh, but this is, uh, you know, basically living room, uh, and there'd also be kitchen area uh, that uh, can support the crew. Here, the bed habs, uh, and uh, we could conceivably at both the uh, plastic level and the vinyl level of Instabase, uh, we could uh, either make or purchase uh, uh, inflatable. Uh, beds and chairs and stuff like this. Uh, this this includes the concept of furniture. So out in the living area, you've got uh, you know inflatable um, uh, couches and stuff like that. And then the bath hab. Um, there's I'll tell you about a fellow who's actually uh, going to be living inside the plastic instabase. Uh, and so what in, in the agriculture working group we spoke about composting toilets. Uh, and uh, actually not just composting, but really like um, incinerating or, or using it uh, in, in the, um, uh, Colin, what do you call it, your, your system? Wetlands, right? Yeah, sorry, Doug. Uh, uh, permacyclers, self-organizing wetland bioreactors uh, is, is the best term for it. And uh, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty neat pick actually. For the, yeah, uh, the yeah. Just in there. Uh, I, that's not mine. It's just something I stole off the internet, of course. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, and yeah, so so you know, the system to be able to recycle uh, human waste. Um, and then the arts hab would, uh, as I mentioned, music. You know, the initial crew of eight could be very talented people because they could be selected from a very large number of young adult applicants, uh, and so people who are who specifically train with tethers to be able to dance in one, six or three, it's gap gravity. Uh, they, they learn the violin or learn the piano or maybe their, their voice or whatnot. And so as we are watching this initial crew, um, we can go ahead and, and the arts can be part of it, not just, not just science and technology. Uh, and then the chemistry, uh, like here's the, for the moon, here's the volatiles in the permanently shadowed crater and what useful uh, chemicals could be made out of that for like CO2, no problem. Um, and then uh, within the work hab, there's a geology section. In my scenario, this is where robots would, would drive out and would collect different samples or core samples uh, and then bring it back through the airlocks into the hab and the geologist amongst the team would go ahead and get these samples and analyze them there and then package them to be shipped uh, back to Earth. For the robotic section, um, dexterous telerobots, as well as uh, like ice harvesting and excavating sort of uh, road building uh, telerobots uh, could be assembled by bringing together the bulky metal parts produced in situ, uh, things like chassis and limbs and wheels, uh, and then shipped uh, in the early years, uh, shipped the things that are not so easily produced on the moon, some precision parts, and, and of course the electronics, which is gonna be quite a while before that's produced uh, in situ. 
And then uh, metallurgy, there's a section actually outside. I think metallurgy is, is best done outside. Um, and it could be, and so it'd be done primarily telerobotically or sort of remote control. Um, and uh, on the moon, 1% of the lunar highlands is uh, unoxidized iron. And on Mars, believe it or not, you may have seen it, there's, we've already seen something like about 60 or so nickel iron meteorites on the surface of Mars. Just, just by the, the rovers driving around, they've seen that many. I mean, have you guys seen one in your life just walking around? Well, these rovers driving a few kilometers, they've, they've already seen that many. So there, there's nice unoxidized metal just sitting on the surface, uh, maybe about 880 kilograms per square kilometer. Um, that, that's just there for the picking. Um, and then uh, after we have sort of automated equipment to produce uh, some sheet metal uh, and produce uh, sort of ingots that can be CNC machined, or we can powderize it and do 3D printing of parts. We can start producing parts for the later on HABs, the, the specialty HABs, as we get into the International Lunar or International Martian ex, uh, exploration phase. Um, so that we're still shipping the inflatables for, for the specialty HABs, but a lot of the furniture and maybe doors and stuff like that are, are, are hopefully being produced off Earth as soon as possible. And machining, uh, we do need good enough quality of metal, uh, but only good enough. We don't need the very best. Uh, and then the green halves, we're working on this with the agriculture working group. I actually designed this to have two green halves uh, simply because for our purposes, it's nice to have smaller, ha you know, a habitat that two guys can lug along the ground and uh, anything more than that size would be really difficult when folded up and, and, and lugged around. So I broke them into two. Um, the, um, the pro I'm sorry, I don't know who the oh, Hold on just a moment, go ahead. I'm so sorry, um, uh, I think you're the only one here. No, I think Swanee is supposed to be oh, here. here. She said that she would be here oh, okay, cool. until six. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, I'm sorry. Okay, no problem. Can you leave the door a little bit open? Hold on. I'm, I just got done at my clinic, and so they're sort of wondering what's going on. <laughs> no problem, no worries. Okay, um, so the uh, prototype lunar greenhouse at the University of Arizona Tucson, they've done some really good work. Uh, I think we can learn from them, but uh, we are also, you know, we've met probably 10 times now in the agriculture working group, uh, and we are getting a clear idea about what, what it would look like to be able to meet all the nutritional needs for initial crew of eight. The spin hab, uh, you could have a, a low mass, it's gotta be anchored well, but a low mass um, centrifuge uh, with swivel chambers on the end so that as you spin up, the force vector is always down through your, through your feet as you, as you swing out. Uh, and uh, you know, getting two hours of full G uh, in the morning, two hours of full G in the evening, doing sedentary activities, activities like we're doing right now, where we can go ahead and look at the screen and we're not making, you know, turning of the head, uh, watching videos, uh, Skyping with people, uh, or at least from the moon. Um, that is something that can be done in the, uh, in, in the um, spin hab. And people can get their uh, full G for about four hours a day, just as a normal part of their, their living, you know, their sedentary time. Um, <clears throat> and, then, and then I should mention that while it's not being used by people, it could be used to do a series of animal studies, starting with mice going through um, like marmosets and, and even uh, more advanced primates uh, to be able to begin to look, you know, try to figure out this artificial gravity prescription for healthy gestation and childhood while we are figuring out what the artificial gravity prescription is to maintain adult health. Now the, the tower there at the top uh, this is actually the, the latest um, plastic module that we created. Here, here it is in the gymnasium, pretty tall. And that there's a clear area, which the idea is that people go up and they can look out uh, some distance. Um, now the bubble hab there in the bottom left, uh, this is uh, just sort of aesthetic, but it is, it is where the crew could actually walk out of their habitats onto the surface of the moon or Mars without putting on a spacesuit. They're still inside, but they feel like that they're outside. 
So that's a cool little feature of the Instabase. Now, in addition, did we go through everything? Yes, we did. So let me talk about some of the external features. And I don't know if we are going to be able to actually do this for the Instabase that, that we have as space advocates. But let's talk and think about what external things that we can have and, uh, as, and how we could mock them up. Now, <clears throat> obviously, the, 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 the landers on the moon and Mars, these, if you're going to make them full size, these things are huge. I don't think you could fit them in, inside a gymnasium, even the long end of the gymnasium. So at most, what we could do is we could, we could take the new Eagle lander and we could lay it on its side without the, without the legs. Uh, we, that's a pretty easy thing to, uh, to mock up. That's just a cylinder with a, a hemisphere at the end. Uh, and then you use these uh, core plast, uh, plastic to make the, the bell uh, of, the, uh, of the engines. Uh, we're probably not going to have uh, mock-ups of this as part of the Instabase, but uh, I just uh, add, you know, throw it in there for completion, <laughs> for completeness. Uh, but there would be uh, solar drapes on the moon at the poles. It would be vertical, um, you know, very high energy. Um, we, I did a calculation using numbers that uh, I think Chris Wolf gave me, uh, and I was asking, you know, how many kilowatts, is that right, kilowatts, yeah, uh, would be needed per person to grow their food. And for the specific power uh, of what has been flown in space, uh, if you were to deliver a 100 ton payload of just, uh, of just solar panels at that efficiency, 60 watts per kilogram, then um, uh, you could support 300 people. The, the, the growing of the plants for 300 people, you could support uh, that many with one delivery of you know, dedicated uh, solar power. Uh, upper right is the, uh, is the ice harvester telerobot. This is the lunar one. The Mars one would be somewhat different than this because uh, you have uh, areas where there's like pure ice on, the, on, on, on Mars. Um, <clears throat> and then the bottom left is the Stexus telerobot. I really love this. This one is from uh, APL. It is, um, do you guys see the pointer that I'm moving around? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, so APL's Advanced uh, Physics Lab. This is John Hopkins University, JHU. Uh, they have developed this thing for the military. It's like diffusing a bomb here, you know, plastic explosive. Uh, but boy, uh, this is a very, you know, it's just like, People. I mean, it's, it's got hands of the right size, it can turn its head, it's going to really do a lot of things. So the idea is to design the wheels and motors and, and the joints of other vehicles, and, and including itself, with quick release mechanisms that a Dexter's Telerobot can easily swap out spare parts and can even begin to do some operations even before crew arrives. Uh, I would like to see them setting up uh, the inflatable habitats, um, moving equipment in, putting it in its mouth, connecting things, uh, and even planting food and harvesting food. And these things could operate 24-7. Uh, now, from uh, on the moon, we can have uh, teleoperations. On Mars, we don't want to be tying up crew time, and an average 14-minute uh, time delay makes that sort of dexterous teleoperations not possible. But I think that we are making progress with uh, uh, robotics, uh, including artificial intelligence. So I think uh, when we need it, I think that the, these uh, dexterous telerobots can do a lot uh, of the work uh, in an automated sort of way on Mars. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, vehicles, uh, which I'll get into later about crew and cargo uh, vehicles. Well, I guess we're getting into it right now. So if you were to take like the cyber truck, the, the battery pack, otherwise known as the skateboard, uh, and you envision um, modules that could slide laterally uh, onto and off of it so that you could have uh, a module that would slide on that would be a crew module or a module that would slide on to it that would be a cargo module, such as uh, taking uh, liquids from here to there. And it would be rather easy for these things to be self-driving because you don't have traffic, you don't have kids bouncing balls, and you, know, you don't have stop signs, you're just following the road. Uh, and so 
what this does is this creates basically a train. It, it creates a, a, a network in which you can supply uh, different things, metals or water or whatnot to all parts of the moon or all, all parts of Mars uh, by creating uh, compacted dirt roads. Uh, and this dramatically opens up the, uh, the availability of resources throughout Mars, uh, but especially throughout the moon. You can, in three days, driving 25 miles per hour, 24 seven, you could deliver volatiles from the permanent shadow creation on the moon all the way to the, the equator. So it basically makes, uh, you know, re it solves a lot of the resource problems. Okay, so let's talk about the different sort of uh, paper bases. Can you guys see the $1 or is that under your, uh, our videos? I can see it. Okay. So uh, the paper base is something that anybody can make. You just go to the website and download it and have fun with scissors and tape. And you can actually go ahead and create uh, the paper base and it cost you $1 to print, <laughs> if even that. Okay, so that's what I call the paper base. The plastic base is the Insta base that we are constructing right now. $1,400 for materials, for plastic and tape. Uh, it's really quite cheap. Now it's the labor, that's the time that you spend. <laughs> that's, it's the sweat equity, you know. Uh, but this is something that any local Mars Society or any other space advocacy group, if you wanted to, uh, we could get you the plans and you could create your own plastic base. Um, now, the vinyl base, I've, I've spoken with some uh, companies that build these children bounce houses and saying, okay, same size as the plastic base, but made out of durable material. Vinyl can be outside, can sort of weather things. You can really stake it into ground, which is important because wind wants to blow this thing around. Uh, so how much would it cost? I'm being given a figure of 50 to $75,000 for the entire base. Um, and, and this base is large enough that it, that it nearly fills a, um, a gymnasium, like high school gymnasium. Um, for, and my hope is that by checking with maybe other, made in other countries like Mexico, and just be transported across the border or uh, through just checking with more vendors and seeing if we can get the price a little bit lower, it might be able to be $45,000 to be able to construct a, uh, a full Insta base made out of vinyl. Um, now, the Kevlar base would be uh, a, it would have to be very highly funded. Uh, and by Kevlar base, I mean, I, what I'm meaning is it's not only constructed with, you know, very relevant material, legitimate material like Kevlar, um, but it would also, you know, we would partner with Paragon Life Support and actually start creating some of the equipment and having engineers, you know, about 25 to 35 engineers and program managers and actually having a, like a small company that would actually seek to really develop this at, at a very high level in preparation for it being developed for the moon. Um, my estimate is to create a, a working base on earth uh, would cost about $100 million. And that is actually what we are hoping, the pathway we are hoping to go. We're hoping to even with this plastic base to be able to contact specific billionaires who might fund this and say, would you like to be able to fund the development of the Kevlar base? Uh, there'd be a lot of publicity potential in this and you would be uh, advancing space development. If, you, if you're interested in that, you'd be advancing it uh, considerably. Uh, because when Elon Musk, when he gets on the moon or when he gets on Mars, um, then what? Well, a billionaire could come and say, this is what we would do after we, after we, we get there. Um, ultimately, the ultimate would be the real base. Uh, and this would be something that would uh, probably require billions of dollars to finish up, you know, uh, all of the systems to, to a level that it could be ready to be launched. So uh, the plastic base, uh, what's, what's the purpose? Why are we doing it? Well, first we are actually gonna try to go for broke and we're gonna try to approach this billionaire and say, would you like to take this concept, uh, in, invite him to the plastic base and sort of show him around. 
and then saying, would you like to uh, actually hire some space architects to really design it proper? Would you like to actually start essentially a company that would be uh, that would hire on uh, engineers of different types and go for it? That's actually what we're the step we're, we're trying to do. We're trying to leapfrog into a really a very advanced program. But if they don't go for that, then at a minimum, what we could do is to use the plastic base to illustrate the uh, the idea that a vinyl this is what a vinyl base could look like. And we would work through the, um, the various space advocacy organizations, the, um, the uh, National Space Society, the Moon Society, but also our, a, a vinyl base would be considerably larger than MDRS, the Mars Desert Research Station in Hanksville, Utah. So, you know, I'll be approaching Zubrin and saying, hey, would you like to really scale up MDRS uh, uh, using this, this vinyl uh, inflatable base. We'll see what goes, what happens. But also there's this guy, Ben Stanley. Um, he uh, attended the Lunar Development Conference uh, that I presented about uh, the InstaBase to, and he got in touch with me. He is actually wanting to live in the plastic base and, and uh, have a little business going uh, that would be YouTube-based in which he's describing how he's Working to develop the toilet for the, for you know, for the bath hab and and how he's working in different parts, you know, different habitats at a time, uh, to be able to uh, to show his viewers and his Patreon supporters uh, what it is that uh, he's attempting to do just on his level, uh, and he actually put out uh, the his fourth video now uh, and. I'm very excited about it. He, I, I shipped him, or, or through his cousin, took what's called the mini hab. It's, uh, it looks like this um, spin hab, uh, but it's uh, 30 feet in diameter. And it was uh, transported to him, and he actually inflated. And he's just produced a video in which he's showing it inflating with a time lapse, uh, and he's also uh, showing on the inside and giving a tour of that. So I'm pretty excited about uh, that development. Um, the plastic base could fit in a, a container about like this, and it could be transported to, you know, high school or colleges or, you know, wherever uh, it, it, uh, it wants to be set up where people pay, you know, $1,000 or so, and they get a show for their students uh, about uh, what is possible on the moon and Mars. Uh, now, the now <clears throat> important point, and, and for, for you guys, and that is, uh, you could have the full vinyl base for uh, about $45,000, I hope. Other groups could actually say, yes, let's go ahead and secure a piece of land. Let's go ahead and uh, line up our volunteer teams and let's go ahead and get a full base. That means you have to go through the process of raising $45,000. Or what you could do is you could say, look, let's just purchase uh, one of these modules from this company, you know, we want to get our orders and it costs a little less if we purchase multiple copies rather than the first one, which has to be designed. And so, for example, if you guys wanted to get the green hab, uh, you could get just the green hab uh, for maybe eight or $9,000. Um, and then you could be working on that and sort of make that as your local group's um, uh, analog base, if you feel you're up to it. So what I'm hoping is first and foremost that this billionaire will actually fund it, you know, legitimately, fully, you know, at a very high level. If that doesn't work, then what I'd like to do is to be able to um, uh, work with uh, major space advocacy organizations. Say, are there places where we would like replicas of the full vinyl base um, in different locations? Uh, I'm just showing Hanksville, and I'm showing. Tucson slash uh, Phoenix and also Central Florida as possible places, no commandments obviously, but possible places where the full bases could be. And then other groups located in other places might have parts of, of the base uh, and focus on some area. And then we all network together and we, we contribute ideas and designs and and uh, maybe you can do a road trip and, and help out with sort of a, a work bees uh, to be able to uh, get organized space advocates to really start working in, in an, an aligned sort of matter 
uh, to be able to advance each of these things, which we know we're going to need uh, when we um, uh, are actually moving off Earth and starting these permanent bases leading to settlement. Um, these are some guesses as to how much uh, each of the individual habitats might cost. And so this might be within the, uh, within the realm of, of what a small group could, uh, could fundraise. Um, and uh, I put this in, I don't know if we want to talk about the initial crew concept. Uh, I've got eight minutes before I need to leave the clinic. What do you guys think? Yeah, maybe open time for question and I could uh, just pass on this or what, what's your wish? Um, yeah, so let's hold on the initial crew if you have to go soon, because I want to get a bit into the Kickstarter so you can oh. give any notes that you have on that too. Okay. Um, so, and just to go a bit more broadly, this is in line with what you're talking about with the Green Hubs concept in that um, this would be focused on essentially outfitting one of the Green Hubs. Um, and I am actually going to share my screen as well now. Um, so the idea that is that we are looking to establish a team of people who want to work essentially on the organizational body of this Kickstarter campaign. And they would be in charge of coordinating the media and arts efforts and the marketing campaigns associated with this and really developing a lot of the media specific to the um, Instahab and the garden itself in order to get that going. Um, but I'm going to share my screen here. So I've got a basic outline for the campaign going, but we're really going to look to try and pick things up at the start of April um, with the start of June again being the launch time for the campaign. Uh, so generally, there are four tiers that we're looking at, and this is based off of Kickstarter just because it has the largest volume in terms of crowdsourcing, though it is likely that we could end up with some other permutations alongside this. Um, so a lot of this is in parallel with what Doug talked about, but the first tier is essentially what we put in just to make sure we get the money from Kickstarter, but it's a thousand dollar non-functional mock-up. So this would essentially be plastic piping and just sort of like a description and like is as simple as we can make it a demo of what the garden would look like. And then 10,000 is our essentially standard goal here where we are looking to build a fully functional prototype um, so this campaign is not intended to build one of the vinyl habitats at the $10,000 level. It's purely focused on the internal equipment for the, um, for, the, uh, for the habitat itself. Sorry, give me just one moment here. Okay. Um, and so level three then is going to be the agricultural unit. So this is where we could look into building a green hab. It's not explicitly cited at this level just because of some of the variability associated with building a fixed structure. Um, everything for the first two levels is intended to pack into a trailer very similar to the one that Doug showed earlier. Um, at level three, we definitely get to where we might exceed that capacity, but it's not necessarily inclusive of a fixed structure at this point. Um, but at level three, we're talking about more than just food production. We're talking about the associated soil production and some of the smarts that would get into a garden like this. Um, and so for those of you familiar with Collins Company, this is when we would be looking to add a wetland bioreactor as well. Um, and we'll put a stretch goal of a million on there too, and likely some more stretch goals, just the way that Kickstarter does it. It's actually very easy to add a lot of intermediate goals in there. Um, but at that level, we'll be building whatever we can come up with in terms of materials and systems that would be beneficial towards the eventual space habitat. But really gardening and the processes involved in it are at the core of the ECLIS system of a space habitat. So there's a lot of room for us to work there and particularly with automation, um, we'll be looking at that. But so a lot of, um, a lot of this works well with Ben as well, because um, if we get to the point where we develop more permanent fixtures and you know, these are intended to tour, but if they need a permanent home, it could definitely end up with him as well. Um, so this document, I believe, is currently available through the MSP public drive if you have access to that. If not, message um, any of us and we can get you set up with that. Um, and then from there, there are just other pieces of it. So we're going to have a bit more info on the garden that still needs to be put in, but you can get that info on developspace.info at the moment. Um, and then we're working on the timeline and marketing info as well, which you can go through and peruse, add any context that you um, are aware of as well, and let us know if you're interested in getting involved in the organizational body. All right. And so, Doug, did you have any notes you wanted to throw on about the uh, campaign there? <clears throat> No, I think you did a good job there, Stelly. 
Ah, thanks. Yeah, and it's going to be an advancement over time. We'll kind of see what our membership availability is like in terms of what media we're able to generate. But definitely, because we have enough time leading up to this, we're going to be able to generate a slim core of, you know, visual pieces and kind of talking points that we'll be able to distribute to a bunch of groups and really magnify the impact of this. But this is definitely a way that, you know, Philly MSP can be a big part of bringing this towards the vinyl base and more permanent Kevlar structures and contribute on the habitat end towards a project we all believe in. All right, and so with that, I'm actually going to end the recording for this evening. Uh, thank you everyone for attending tonight's uh, meeting of Mars Society of Philadelphia.